that we'll be beginning a new sermon series. It's always the joke. Every time we start a new one, I'm so excited for the new sermon series. And yet again, I am very excited to be taking a look at the book of Philippians. Starting today, we are going to work our way through Philippians. And so over the next um, 12 weeks, with a week off for Easter and a, and a week off for a special guest, we have 10 messages that will take us through Paul's letter to the Philippian church. Now, before getting into all this, too, I just want to make one little disclaimer. Uh, my Bible was completely falling apart that I've had as long as I've been a pastor. I've taped it. I've done all kinds of things. I bought a new one. And we are joking. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but over the last few months, my reading has been more like this. I actually got a large print edition. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I turned 46 last week. But the other thing, yeah, some of you are like, oh, yeah, whoop de doo <laughs> But the other thing is, I do want to make mention of this, actually. Um, I, am, I bought an ESV, English Standard Version. I've been preaching out of the... I've been preaching out of the NIV for a long time, and I love the NIV. It's nothing against the NIV. Um, but the, uh, the older NIV, you can still get it. It's getting a little harder. But if you're following along and wondering why a word or two does not match up, I've been studying through the ESV for the last year and a half, actually, going through the entire Bible and decided to, uh, to make the switch. I, I just wanted to make that disclaimer. I know some of you don't even use either of these. It's fine. We have all kinds of different translations. There's very good ones out there. This does not mean that everyone has to go out and buy an ESV and that this is now the infallible word of God. It's the translation that I'm going to be using. And I just wanted to make that disclaimer in case anyone's going, whoa, hang on a second. I've been following along with him for five and a half years. What's he reading? Well, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So with that disclaimer. Now, before getting into the letter, though, also, I, I, if you weren't already thinking about school after our quiz, I, I just want to bring you there one more time. Just indulge me for a moment by asking a question. Have any of you ever received an incomplete for a grade in school before? By show of hands? Okay, all right. We've got a few people that have received an incomplete. Some of you maybe weren't honest, didn't want to fess up. I don't know. Receiving an incomplete is extremely frustrating. I know firsthand, I hate to say. I remember my freshman year in college. I received an incomplete for my applied lesson grade. Now, as a music major, if you guys remember, I, I studied music. I have two music degrees. As a music major, you are required to take what was called applied lesson. You had to do that every semester on your primary instrument, which for me was bass trombone. Hour-long class, about three hours a day of homework if you wanted to practice and be any good. But at the end of the grading period, every single semester, you had to play a solo in front of the entire music faculty. You went into the band room and you played through a prepared piece and they graded you. And that was a big chunk of your grade for your applied lesson. <coughs> big weight on that. So my second semester of my freshman year in college, I was scheduled to go at one o'clock. And so I was down in the practice room warming up with my accompanist, getting all ready, trying to get the nerves out, ready to go. I've only done this once before. And so at about 12.55, we made our way down to the band room, which is where they heard all of those things, where I was scheduled to play. And so I'm waiting outside the door for the door to open, so that'll be my time. And just at 1 o'clock, the door opens up, and the entire music faculty comes walking out of the room. My trombone instructor comes walking out and jumps all over me. I will give you the family-friendly version today. But he says, where were you? I, I told him, I, I was down in the practice room warming up. He said, you were supposed to go at 10 o'clock this morning. Where were you? I guess I forgot to put a zero. I had 1 o'clock written in my planner, not 10 o'clock. I left a zero off. And I was like, oh, man, I am so sorry. I'm ready to go right now. He said, well, that's too bad. He walked off. I was like, oh, what do I do? I, get a re I received an incomplete for my lesson. And, and this would actually put getting my degree in jeopardy because this was a required class. 
You had to have a grade every single semester as a music student. And so what I had to do, what I wound up doing, was I had to work out along, amongst all the music faculty schedule at the University of Montana, about 20 people. I had to work their schedules out sometime within the first four weeks of the next semester to play for them and get a grade. Wow, talk about a task. That was a pain. And thankfully, I, I did it. Yes, incompletes are not fun. And in fact, they're extremely frustrating. No one wants to receive an incomplete. This morning, I want you to know that on the authority of God's word, there are no incompletes in the body of Christ. Not one. What a glorious thing to hear this morning. And I want you to keep that in mind as we begin our study through the book of Philippians today. Now, before I get into the, the, the meat of today's passage, I want to just read the first two verses and just take about three minutes and just give you some overview of Paul's letter that we're going to be spending the next uh, couple months in. And again, uh, you get past First and Second Corinthians, you get to the general epistles section, the smaller ones, the General Electric Power Company. That's how you remember it. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So we're right there, Philippians. Let me read to you the first two verses. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We see right there in the introduction to the letter, this is a very standard introduction, it is a letter written from Paul and Timothy to the church in Philippi. The address is to all of the believers in Philippi as well as the church leadership. Paul is writing a letter to the church. Now, while you do not see it in the introduction, it's been determined through study and through some things mentioned in the body of the letter itself that Paul probably wrote this letter while he was in prison in Rome about AD 62. This is one of his prison epistles, it's called. He was imprisoned, he was under guard, but he could still write letters because it was house arrest, and so he'd send these letters out. That's probably where this letter was written. The overall purpose of this letter is to encourage the church in Philippi. This is a letter to encourage. This was the first church that Paul founded in Europe during one of his missionary travels, and it held a very special place in his heart. Paul loved the Philippian church. This is a pastoral letter of encouragement. That's what it is. And the thing to keep in mind as we go through this letter is that the Philippian church was a very strong church. This was a good church. There was not a lot of issues like we see in some of the other letters that Paul writes, particularly to the Corinthian church. Ooh, that one had some issues. But the Philippian church, these guys are doing really quite well. Paul doesn't have to take this church to task over things, but neither does he want them to just settle in and coast. And I think, in many ways, this letter could have been written to the Cheyenne Alliance Church as well. This is a good church that's doing a lot of good things. There is history of serving the Lord and a desire to continue to serve the Lord right here in this church body. But we cannot begin to coast. We can't just settle in and put it on neutral and just coast now. Paul's purpose is to encourage the Philippian church in their faith so that they would not settle, but they would continue to grow in their faith. And my prayer for all of us, individually and corporately, as we go through this letter, is the same thing. May we never settle and just coast, holding on to past glories, but may we continue to serve the Lord as we grow in faith. That's the challenge over the next number of weeks. So with all of that background then in place and all of those things said, let me read to you verses 3 through 11, the body of the text for our passage today. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I told you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense 
and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul begins the letter by letting the church know that he prays with them regularly with joy. Really, Paul is highlighting what he prays for the Philippian church all the way through verse 11. And this really is a great prayer for a church. In fact, I think it serves as a model prayer that each of us can pray for our church. And I encourage you to do so. As you just look through these verses, pray that out loud for Cheyenne Alliance Church. The other thing that we see in these opening verses is that Paul is filled with joy. When he thinks about the Philippian church, his heart is warmed. A smile comes to his face. He is filled with joy. What a great thing to be able to say. And it got me thinking. When people think of the Cheyenne Alliance Church, are they filled with joy? That's a pretty strong question. When people think of the Cheyenne Alliance Church, are they filled with joy? whether they're part of this body now, have been part of the body in the past, are part of another body, but have done things with our church, are they filled with joy when they think of Shine Alliance Church? I hope so. This should encourage us to make sure that we are living our lives in such a way, both individually and corporately, so that when people think about Shine Alliance Church, they are filled with joy. I hope we could say that across the board. Now, one of the things that jump out in Paul's prayer is contained in verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful statement of confidence in God. What Paul is saying, in effect, is this is God's church and he is completing it. That's what he's saying. This is God's church and he is completing it. He's saying that about the Philippian church, and he's saying that about our church. This is God's church, and he is completing it. Jesus himself affirms that it's God's church, and that that God's the one doing the building in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is building his church and there is nothing that can stop God's work and him bringing it to completion. God has a plan. He is working it out and there is nothing that will get in his way. Nothing. Does anyone here today have an unfinished project at home or at work? Okay. Okay. You know, perhaps there's some repair job at home at the house that simply needs to get done, but you don't have the expertise perhaps, or the resources, or even maybe the motivation to get it done and completed, and so it sits there in this perpetual unfinished state, staring up at you every time you walk in the room. Understand that that is not true for the church. That is not true for this church. God will finish what he has started when it comes to his church. We can say that emphatically. God will finish what he has started when it comes to his church. You can bank on that. Now, I believe that this is true for both the church corporately, the church, on, a, on, on you know, the church with a capital C worldwide, for this church corporately, as any other church corporately, and I also believe that it's true for the individual believer. God has no incompletes on both the macro and the micro level. Do you sometimes feel as though you're not making any progress in your spiritual life? Does that ever assault anybody in your mind? Understand that when God starts a project, He completes it. God will help you grow in grace until he has completed his work in your life. When you are discouraged, remember, God won't give up on you. 
He promises to finish what he has started. God will not begin a work in you to only kick you out on the curb and drive off leaving you there. When you feel incomplete, unfinished, or distressed by your perceived shortcomings, remember and be confident in God's promise and His provision. Don't let your present condition rob you of the joy of knowing Christ or keep you from growing closer to Him because He who has begun a work in you is faithful to bring it to completion. And when we hold on to these truths, it helps us to remember the true foundation for any spiritual growth, really. Again, both individually and corporately for the entire church. Understand that the foundation for spiritual growth is recognizing that it is God who began a good work and He will bring it to completion. That's the foundation for spiritual growth. You have to know who begun the work. You have to know who's going to bring it to completion. It's not up to you. It's God's work in you, both individually as a person and the church as a whole. This is God's church, and you are His child. He has begun a good work in the Cheyenne Alliance Church. He has begun a good work in each of you, and He will bring it to completion. Genuine spiritual progress is rooted in what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. That's genuine spiritual progress. It is rooted in what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. And we see in the text that Paul has been confident, and he continues to be confident. Some verses will say, being confident of this. He has been confident, he continues to be confident that God will complete his work. What great confidence we can have in the God who completes what he has begun in his church and in each and every child of his. That's awesome. So, we see that God has no incompletes and that he will bring everything into completion that he has begun. But what should we expect? What does a completed project of God's look like? You know, maybe, maybe there's that project at home that you're trying to complete, and you've got some drawings, and you, and you know what the finished project's going to look like by and large, and so you get at it. But, but we see that God's completing His project. But what does it look like? What should we expect? What does a completed God project look like? Well, thankfully, Paul spells that out for us in the remainder of his prayer. Follow along as I read one more time verses 7 through 11, because here is a picture of what a completed project looks like. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I told you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. <clears throat> Before diving into what a completed project looks like, Paul reiterates his love for the Philippian church. Again, this is a very special church to Paul. It was near and dear to his heart. Paul's love for the Philippian church was deeper than just human emotion. Oh, boy, I love that church. No, it was the selfless affection of Jesus himself. He loved the church just as Christ did. And I really do hope that each of us can say the very same thing. I pray that we would be filled with love for our church family. And that being a part of this family, the Cheyenne Alliance Church, would be one of the greatest joys in your life. I pray that. You know, life can be hard, no doubt. But when you are involved in a loving church family, it makes a huge difference. May each of you be filled with love for each other and for what the Lord is doing 
as we live life and serve the Lord alongside each other. That's how it should be. We say we connect, grow, serve at this church, and I pray that we do each and every day more and more so. Now, as we read through the text, we see four things emerge that we can expect as Jesus brings us to completion. And the first is that we are partakers of grace together. That's part of the completed project. We are partakers of grace together. We all share in God's grace. And this is true, especially in initial salvation. We've all been saved by grace. There's no one that, if you're saved, you've been saved by grace. Every single person was dead in their sin with no hope for life, but God broke through with grace so that we could receive salvation that is available only through Jesus. For every person who belongs to this church as a born-again believer, we have that common bond. We are partakers in grace together. What a wonderful thing to be able to celebrate together. And we do that regularly when we gather in this setting. We celebrate the fact that we are born again a child of God, and we are that together as a church family. However, we also experience God's grace in the daily working out of our lives together. There are times when someone in the church has a need. Perhaps they are facing illness or some kind of mechanical difficulty at their home or with a vehicle. There are many people who can help out and who do. This church is notorious for helping people out. (laughs) That's wonderful. So many of you make meals to bless people in our church or give of your expertise to help in a particular situation. Others of you are prayer warriors who intercede on behalf of those in our congregation Or perhaps you're an encourager who can speak a word of encouragement to someone who is hurting. I know that the encouragement cards get used. I received a few. I know many of you have received some. What a blessing. There are so many ways in which this church demonstrates God's grace to each other that I could fill up the next four hours with examples. Just understand that God completes that, or that as God completes His work in this church, we will be partakers of His grace with each other. And that's a wonderful, blessed thing. Amen. Along that line, the next thing that we see in the text is that our love will abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. That's also what a completed project looks like. Our love will abound more and more with knowledge and all discernments. As God completes His work, we will demonstrate that in our love for God and for each other. In fact, Paul says that it will abound more and more. Love will come out and it'll keep coming out more and more, spilling out everywhere. Just picture a a bucket that I'm filling up with water and it just keeps overflowing all over the place. That's what will happen. Our love will overflow everywhere. And it's this kind of love that is knowledgeable about God and His ways. It is filled with discernment. In other words, depth of insight and perception. Boy, somebody needs a touch. Let me love on them. More and more. This kind of love, it it pours out and it overflows everywhere, and it touches each and every person in this church. If you've ever been to, um, to Pirate's Cove Water Park in Inglewood, Colorado, just outside of Denver, I know some of you have been there. We've gone there together, actually. It's sort of like that big bucket that dumps water on you. If you haven't been there, there's this giant bucket. I mean, it's huge. It sits on top of the, the water park play area, and it's constantly being filled with water. There's like this big hose. And and when it's full, this bell starts to sound, and everyone goes running over to this big X. I mean, it's it's huge, like the size of this stage. And then it tips over and it dumps water on you. I mean, saturating you, maybe even like up to 30, 40 people get soaked with this as the water dumps out. This is how it is with the church that Jesus is completing. Our love pours out. 
unto everyone, meeting needs with all knowledge and discernment. In other words, spending time on the things that really matter and building one another up in ways that they really need. Now, the next thing that we can expect as Christ completes us is that we will be able to approve what is excellent so that we are pure and blameless. That's the next mark. We will be able to approve what is excellent so that we are pure and blameless. This helps us to know what is best and what will really honor the Lord. There's a lot of things that we could be doing as a church. I get phone calls all the time about the next great thing that I should be doing if I want to grow my church. You think phone solicitation is bad at the house? Becky can attest, it's notorious in the church. (laughs) I bet you we average five plus phone calls a week of someone wanting us to buy into the next great thing. But we will know or be able to approve as to what is excellent. We know what will really honor the Lord. We will have the ability to differentiate between right and wrong, good and bad, healthy and dangerous, vital and trivial, so that we can build one another up and further God's kingdom, yes. But we will also be able to decide between acceptable and right, good and best, important and urgent. In other words, we will know what really matters so that we spend our time as a church truly honoring the Lord, not getting bogged down into all kinds of other things. Churches that truly know what they are about and maximize their efforts to do kingdom work, that's a great place to be. People are valued. They're used by God to do great things, and the church in turn is blessed. And this is where we are going. And it is the work that God is doing right here in Cheyenne Alliance Church. And he brings his church to completion. And each of us gets to be a part of it. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? What a team to be on. Now the last thing that we see in a completed church is that we are filled with the fruit of righteousness. We are filled with the fruit of of righteousness. When you are in a church that God is completing, you will see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Little sword drill, where where is that? Galatians, Ethan, my man, five. Four. Yeah, my man. Good job, Ethan. Yeah. Good job, Ethan. All right. Galatians chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, if you didn't get that. (laughs) The fruit of the Spirit. It's all listed right there. When we are in a church that God is completing, we will see that fruit. It'll be lived out among each other. And this helps to build the church up even more because who doesn't want to experience love? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, uh, self-control, faithfulness, self-control. Does anyone here not want to experience that? <laughs> we all do. And when we experience that more and more, it's a wonderful thing. That's what happens. We are filled with the fruits of righteousness when we belong to a church that God is completing. Now, the other thing about this is that God he will get the glory for the fruit because it's only possible through him. A healthy, mature, and completed church will never pat themselves on the back for all the good fruit because it's only possible through Christ. When we exhibit love to one another, praise God, don't pat yourself on the back. When you have a moment of self-control within the body of Christ, thank Jesus for allowing you to have that. He's the one that produces the fruits. Wow. What a wonderful start to this great letter. 
God is working in his church. God is working in the Cheyenne Alliance church. And God is working in each and every person that makes up this church. When you are a church or in a church that belongs to Jesus, truly belongs to the Lord, you will be completed. And it's awesome. You know, some of you raised your hand when I asked about unfinished projects at home or at work, and I hate to say I could be right there with you. I've got a floorboard that reminds me every time I walk on it. You may look at those projects and see failure written all over it. Every time that floorboard gives way, maybe you think, failure. I'm a failure. I don't know. But one thing I do know is that God does not see failure when he looks at the Cheyenne Alliance Church. And he does not see failure when he looks at you. He sees his grand project that he will bring to completion. There are no incompletes when it comes to what God is doing in his church and in you. Amen for that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are the God of completion. And you call people unto yourself. You remove their sin and you give them life. We are new creations. Created in advance for good works. That you've created for us to do. That is true individually. That is true corporately. There are no incompletes when it comes to your project. And Lord, I thank you for that. There are so many places in my own life that I need you to continue that work and you are faithful to bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And that is true for each and every person. Lord, there are things here in this church that you are continuing to do, steps you want us to take, directions you want us to go so that we can share the gospel message, we can bring more people in, we can build people up. And you're bringing it to completion. And Lord, we get to be just a small part of of your church worldwide. Not just the Christian and Missionary Alliance, but all born-again believers. And you're completing that church. And one day, Lord, we will be in your presence for eternity. In the new heaven, in the new earth. When everything is absolutely complete. And until that time, Lord Jesus, we say continue your work. Here we are. Take all of me as we just sung a little bit ago. My entire life and do your completion. We thank you that we can be confident of this. That you who began a good work is faithful to bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with one last song.